Be with you, Sam.
First scripture reading comes from Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. It will be found on page 747 of your The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me round among them, and behold, there were many upon the valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said to me, Prophecy to these bones, and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, but breath in you. And you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. As I looked, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophecy to the breath, prophecy. Son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded it, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great host. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are clean cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves. O oh, my people, and I will bring you home into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. I will open your graves and raise you from your graves. O oh, my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, says the Lord. Our second reading is from Romans chapter 8, verses 6 through 11, and can be found on page 982, if you buy if you might follow along. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. But the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit. If the spirit of God really dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although your bodies are dead because of sin, your spirits are alive because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to your lower bodies also through his spirit which dwells in you. Our final scripture reading is John 11, chapter, chapter 11, verses 1 to 45, on page 934 of the Bible. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha, it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness is not unto death, it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by means of it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus, sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And after he said to the disciples, Let us go into Judea again, the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were but now seeking to stone you, and you going there again? Jesus answered, Are you are there not twelve hours in a day? If anyone walks in one day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. Thus he spoke, and then he said to them, 
Our friend Lazarus had fallen asleep, but I go to wake him out of sleep. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go also, that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary and sold them concerning their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary sat in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, although he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, he who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying quietly, The teacher is here, and he is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house and sold her, <coughs> saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Then Mary, when she came where Jesus was and saw him, fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And he said, Where are you leaving him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, How he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus deeply moved again and came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you would believe you, that if you would believe you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. I knew that thou hearest me always, but I have said this on account of people standing by, that they may believe that thou didst send me. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with bandages, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to him, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I brought a book with me today. Do you guys know this movie, The Jungle Book? The Jungle Book? It's a cute little story, isn't it? It's about a little guy named Mowgli, right? And he's raised kind of lost in the woods when he's an infant, and he's raised by a pack of wolves. And Mowgli makes lots of friends along the way. He, he meets this bubbling kind of bear, um, Baloo. Do you remember Baloo? Okay. And Hattie, the elephant. I'm not too sure that um, the snake was his, the Ka was his friend. He was trying to eat him. But um, in the story, Let's see, there's King Louie. Do you guys remember King Louie, the ape guy? There's the king of the apes. He's, he's got a lot of beats. Remember him in the songs? And they, they kind of all get kind of worried because Shere Khan, the tiger, is coming. And they're afraid that because Mowgli's in the village that they're all going to be eaten by the tiger. So they kind of oust Mowgli. And Mowgli becomes friends with this group of Vultures. Do you remember the group of vultures? They're kind of silly guys. But I'm going to play a little song, hopefully, here. 
with the vultures that um, they so if you want to if you want to gather around here. Yeah. Do you guys have any friends like that? That's always inside. No, I'm not going to play all the way to the end. Do you guys have any friends that are there for you all the time? Like if you're sad, they're always there to listen or help. Or if you need somebody to come over and do something no matter what time of the day or the night it is, they'll, they're always there to help you. Or maybe you are that friend to someone sometimes. Great. I have friends like that. I have a couple of really, really close friends that no matter when I call them, they're there to help me out. And I really appreciate that. And I try to be that way for them. But in our, in our Bible story today, Jesus was that kind of a friend to Lazarus. Lazarus had become very sick. And Jesus um, didn't go right away to the city where they lived in Bethany. And when he got there... Um, Lazarus had already died. It was four days after Lazarus had died. And his sister, Martha, was very upset with Jesus because Martha, he, she thought that if Jesus had come, Lazarus wouldn't have died. So she was very upset when he got there. And um, Jesus, actually, Mr. Um, Millinger read in, in the Bible, out of the Bible today, that this was one of the times in the Bible that Jesus was accounted for crying when he got there because he was deeply moved when he saw all of these people grieving for Lazarus. So Jesus asked them to take him to the place where Lazarus was buried. And it was like a cave with a stone in front of it. And Jesus asked them to move the stone away. And Jesus, remember Lazarus has been dead for four days. And in my Sunday school class, we watched a, a movie about this a little bit today. And when they opened the door, there was a great odor. It smelled really bad. And Jesus prayed, and he hollered into the tomb and said, Lazarus, get up and walk out. And everybody in the crowd just didn't really know what was going on because, you know, He'd been in there four days. So as Jesus kept telling Lazarus to come out, he did. He walked out. He was all bound in um, the rope, not ropes, but cloth and things. And he was no longer sick or hurt in any way. He was alive again. And that was a great miracle. Do you think we all need a friend like that? That's a great friend, isn't it? Is that a good friend? Do you know we have a friend like that? Who is that friend? The same friend. We have the same friend as Lazarus. Do you know that Jesus loves each of you and all of us the same way that he loved Lazarus? That's right. He, as in the, the words of the little song, he loves us to the bitter end. Is that right? Yeah. And do you know what? Jesus even loves us past the bitter end because where do we go when we to heaven to be with Jesus. So isn't that great? Jesus gave his life so we could spend the rest of our lives with him in heaven. That's a true friend, isn't it? Let's say a prayer. Dear God, 
thank you for loving us so much that you gave your son to save us into eternity. Amen. Gracious God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts and minds be acceptable in thy sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I think perhaps it is because of, of that fact, because we're so uncomfortable talking about death, that we have all kinds of ways of talking about life. Of talking about what it means to be alive. Because as obvious as that may sound, in fact, the fact is, it's anything but obvious at all, this whole business of life and death. At its most basic level, there are various measures of strictly biological function for us that indicates life. For most of human history, we talk about people breathing or their hearts still beating as the baseline test of being alive. Though in recent years, in, in modern times, with all of our modern medical breakthroughs, um, and as a result of being able to, to maintain that breathing function, and even that heartbeat artificially now, the more significant measure of life for us today has become brain activity. If you can see, if you know that there's activity going on in the brain, we deem that medically alive. And while such measures certainly mean something, and as important as they obviously are in the field of medicine, I don't think anyone here this morning would equate merely existing at some biological level with really and truly living. At least not living in the real sense of the word when we say living. And you know then, even when someone really has died, has passed away, to use a popular euphemism, we 
often say that something about them lives on. You might even have heard me say something like that at a funeral service or a celebration of life. The deceased, the person who's died, who's passed away. There's something about them that lives on. Specifically using that phrase, lives on. In fact, that phrase is found in the Bible. In the book of Revelation, we are told that blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, for they rest from their labors, and their work shall live on. And that's true. And in some cases, so true that ironically, some people were never so alive as when they have died. Actually having a bigger impact on those that were around them in death than they ever did in life. Well, of course it's not literally true to say that someone is more alive dead than when they were actually alive. Still it points, I think, to an added and very important dimension of what we mean when we talk about living. Indeed, even that life and death are in reality not always the mutually exclusive categories we so often take them to be. And so I want to turn to our three scriptures that, that Ed graciously read for us this morning. And all three of these scripture lessons deal with this matter of life and death. And they do so in ways that remind us that life is a whole lot more than simple biological existence. Our Old Testament lesson this morning from Ezekiel, it was the famous story of the dry bones. You know, you think dead bones, dead bones, dead bones, dead bones dry bones. Oh, Lordy, Lordy, indeed I know it, Lordy, oh, Lordy, yeah! Dim bones gonna rise again, dim bones gonna rise again. Wait, is this on it? Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I just had a flashback to my senior youth camp days. Uh, it happens when you get older, Jessica. So, uh, <laughs> Them my bones, Ezekiel. <laughs> you want to rise again? Quite a story about the bones coming back together in that, in that prophecy, in that dream, in that idea of that death is not the final answer. In Romans, we heard today more of Paul's ongoing reflection on the nature of the spirit and of the flesh including that famous comment of Paul's, to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Finally, in the Gospel of John, we heard the story of Jesus raising his friend Lazarus from the dead. Though, as always, in this Gospel story in John, there's a lot more to the story than initially meets the eye. Not the least of the fact that is, is that by the end of the story, while Lazarus is clearly no longer dead, it's not so nearly so clear that he's really alive, at least alive in the fullest sense of that term. Again, raising for us as Christians that question, what does it mean to really be alive? So what is life? What does it mean to be alive? I mean, there's life, and then there's living, living. And I'm not sure we're very clear on just exactly what that spark is that transforms that basic biological existence, that brain activity that hopefully we all have into living, really living. One way we try to get a handle on that here in church is to make a distinction between what we call life and what scripture calls eternal life. Generally, though, when we use those terms, we tend to mean two quite distinct realms. Life meaning our life here on this world, uh, and eternal life meaning our existence in the realm of the hereafter, life after death. 
a life that is lived in an entirely different world than what we see right here in front of us. But while that may be, well, how we tend to think of things, uh, of the distinction between life and death, that's not nearly so true of what we find in the Bible itself. For there is instead often a considerable overlap between life and eternal life, especially in the Gospel of John, where the distinction between the two kinds of life is not that of two separate worlds, completely distinct and completely apart, but more like our distinction between mere existence and really living. Or as Jesus himself put it, between life and between and life abundant. Not just life, but life abundant with God. When you get right down to it, this is pretty much the same distinction that Paul is making when he talks in his letters about life in the spirit and life in the flesh. Unfortunately, we're so conditioned by years of Christian moralizing to automatically think of sex when we hear the word flesh in the Bible, that most of us completely miss the point that Paul is actually making here and throughout this whole section in Romans because he's not talking about sex in this part of Romans or anything else we include under the general heading of pleasures of the flesh. Instead, he's talking here purely and simply about human mortality, about our existence as finite mortal creatures. When he says that to set the mind on the flesh is death, he's not making a moral judgment at all about humans. He's simply stating a biological fact. The fact that we are all going to die. Which then means that if we're, if, if all we're invested in for this life is the flesh, what we are right now, that is to say the world of the flesh, then it's all going to come to an end someday. Not because there's something wrong with the flesh, certainly not because it's evil. After all, God created and created us. And it, we're not evil. The flesh is not evil. But simply because it's mortal. And it's not going to last forever. That's just a fact. If you don't believe me, just look in the mirror. And if you do think you still look pretty good, just wait a few years. <laughs> there's no future in the flesh. Literally. Well, there's not. Which is precisely what Paul is trying to say in this section of Romans. But if, by contrast, we set our minds on the Spirit, if we're invested in this life in the gifts of the Spirit, if we put our energies in life into love and joy and peace and kindness and generosity, all those gifts of the Spirit, if we have lifted up our hearts to the Lord, then even though our mortal flesh one day will die, even though that mortal flesh will die, we shall still live. Because unlike the flesh, the gifts of the Spirit, most of all, love will never die. Which, of course, is Paul's whole point in 1 Corinthians 13, which comes to close with the words, and the greatest of these is love. And why does he say that? Because it never ends. <coughs> love never ends. Which is why Jonathan Edwards famously called heaven a world of love. The problem with language like that, though, is that it can very easily sink into a little more than sentimentality. Which is largely what happened to Christianity in the Victorian era. when Christian faith became a little more than just warm feelings inside. So I, I wanted to give you an example of what I'm trying to say here. Um, and, and more importantly, what it is that I believe John and Paul are talking about when they're talking about life and death here in the scriptures. And that, that, that's about as far from being sentimental, I believe, as you can possibly get. And the, the thing that comes to my mind, it's actually a scene from a movie. An old, old movie. It might even have been in black and white. I, 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 that's probably 
remember. But I'm pretty sure the movie was made in the early 60s, and I tried to look it up and find the, the name of the movie, and I couldn't, couldn't remember. I couldn't find the name of it. Some of you would do better research than me and can probably find it out. But, it, but it's, in many respects, this movie was one of the last of the, of the old-time Western movies, that, that genre, which we really don't see anymore. Uh, and I would recommend, actually recommend that you see this movie. Uh, it's not that great a movie, but there's a scene that just sticks in my mind. And actually, the last ten minutes of this movie, when I saw that movie, it impressed me because it was the bloodiest movie I had ever seen. Because all these guys got shot up. I mean, there's a big gunfight and all these guys are getting killed. And all the, all the heroes of the movie get killed in the end. And that didn't happen in the 60s much at all. But, but it did in this movie, and that's probably not one of the real famous movies. But the, the scene I'm talking about happens just before that big shootout, that final time they're forced to make a decision. Whether they're going to give their friend up for dead without a fight, because I know the Mexican warlord will probably kill them, or are they going to at least try to rescue their friend, knowing full well that they have two chances to rescue them, slim and none. But they're probably going to die if they try to go help their friend. Not much of a choice at all. And they're, they're perplexed about what they should do. But then one day, one of the men gets up. And there's this look exchanged among all of them. They all look at each other. Just a look. And it's still a look that I remember to this day, more than 40 years after I've seen that particular movie. And they all get up, and they head off to what is probably going to be their deaths. I hate to spoil the movie for you, but it is. They all get killed. <laughs> all that's ever said in that entire scene is, let's go. You know, it's been more than 40 years, probably closer to 50 years since I saw that movie. But I always think of that scene whenever I read the story of Lazarus. And I think of it because of something that Thomas says in the early part of this particular story. Jesus is talking with his disciples about, about going to, to the town of Bethany where his beloved friend Lazarus is near death. And the disciples are reluctant to go because they're afraid the Jews are going to try to stone Jesus and they might try to kill them as well. They don't really want to go back there. They know that there's nothing but trouble that's going to come out of Jesus going back uh, to Bethany. And in fact, they're, they're exactly right. There's going to be a lot of trouble when he does go back there. But then Thomas. Yeah, it's that Thomas. Down like Thomas, if you want to know. Thomas looks at his fellow disciples and he says, let us go so that we can die with him. I can't help but think that that look on Thomas' face as he said those words was the same look that was on Wayne Holden's face in that movie when he said those words, let's go. They knew, they knew that life was really not worth living unless there's something you're willing to die for. That, I think, is what it means to be alive. What it is in the end that makes a difference between merely existing really living is loving someone or something so much that you'd be willing to die for them. In fact, that dying with them is more important than living without them. And when I think about that, that is exactly what Jesus did. He chose dying with us over living without us. Why? Because he loves us with a love so wondrous and so deep that it has created an eternal bond between God and us. An eternal bond. So much so that Bound to us by that love, Jesus died for us. And bound to him by that wondrous love, we shall then rise with him to life eternal. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Spirit, to whom all glory and honor be now and forever. Shall we pray? Gracious God, it is a wondrous love that envelops us now in this place. Your wondrous love for us. Your love that sustains us in life and in death. Thank you, Almighty God, for abundant life, life in you. It is with that assurance of abundant life that we pray in your holy name. Amen. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Our life is here with us now, and we are called as Christians to share the abundance of God with all those who are in need. And so now we have that opportunity as our ushers come forward this morning. We ask that you share with a generous heart and a generous spirit as our tithes and offerings are forth.
small tokens of our abundance be allowed to fly away and to be used for the furthering of your kingdom on this world. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pause for a moment uh, of silence before prayer, especially remembering those being honored on this Memorial Day weekend shall we pray. Gracious Sovereign God, Lord of all nations, on this Memorial Day Sunday, we pause to reflect upon our blessings as a nation and the high cost of those blessings for so many. Thank you for the freedom we enjoy in this country, for opportunities for, to flourish, and for the security we have here in our land. Thank you for those who have given their lives in service to our country, sacrificing in such a costly way for the sake of others, for our sake. Thank you for a day set apart, not just for celebration, but also for solemn remembrance as we consider the sacrifices of so many on behalf of us. <coughs> oh Lord, may, may we be more aware of just how blessed we are as a nation. May we be more grateful for our blessings, more faithful and stewarding, stewarding them well, more eager to share them with other people. We pray today for the family and friends of those who have given their lives in service to our nation. May they be comforted in their sadness. May they be reassured that the sacrifice of their loved ones contributed to a worthy cause. May they be proud of those they have lost and trusting their ultimate faith into your gracious hands. Even as we remember those who have given their lives in the past, we also think of those whose lives are on the line today, our men and women around the world, in places of conflict and violence. Protect them. <coughs> encourage them. Bring them home safely and soon. Give wisdom to the leaders of our nation that they might know best how to deploy our troops in the cause of freedom. May their efforts be successful so that true peace with justice can finally be established in our world. Guide those, all those involved in our country's affairs. Help them to pursue paths that prevent needless conflict and violence and death. May they have your wisdom about when and how to use the might of this country as you entrust it. God of peace, stir in the hearts of the leaders of all nations and all who would use violence to further their cause. Change their hearts and minds. Give them a passion for peace. Bring an end to the pain, suffering, injustice, and violence in our world. We know, dear Lord, that ultimate peace will not come until your kingdom is here in all of its fullness, in all of its glory. Nevertheless, we pray for a foretaste of that kingdom. We ask for the growth of peace throughout the world today so that fewer and fewer men and women will have to risk and sacrifice their lives. May your kingdom come, Lord, and your will be done as it is in heaven. All praise be to you, God of grace, God of mercy, God of justice, God of peace. Continue to be with us now. As together we pray the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, O oh God, who art in heaven, God be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
Let us rise in your body or spirit one more time as we worship together and join our voices together in the hymn number 746. He keeps me singing. So,
Channel 7 and 98 TV and web broadcasting are made possible through contributions and donations from viewers like you. Thank you for your support.